Traders are back from their Labor Day holiday weekend, and it was a bit of a goofy day. We saw Bitcoin and the blue chips uh, get smoked to the downside. Uh, at least Bitcoin uh, was down significantly, and, and the Dow was down comparatively to the other indices as well. Uh, but the odd part is that the NASDAQ composite hit an all-time high. Uh, we were up just barely at the end of the day on the NASDAQ, and it was led higher mostly because of uh, some positive movements out of stocks like Apple. So uh, anyway, we'll take a look at all of that and see what it means for our posture. Then we'll get into our trade application example, where I wanted to focus on a speculative trade to the upside that is showing some oversold cluster signals on a weekly candle chart. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Z. It's September 7th, 2021. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below to our description and sign up for our email distribution list so that way you can be notified anytime we do post these videos. We also post the oversold and overbought cluster signals on the S&P 500 stocks at the bottom of those emails. In addition to that, we're heavy users of Twitter. If you're not doing so already, I would encourage you to follow me at Brandon Van Z. In fact, today's trade application example uh, is uh, a chart that I was tweeting about on Friday. So sometimes you'll get some insight as to what I might be talking about on the Market Outlook video if you are following me on Twitter. And then last but not least, we do have a presence over on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in that logo in front of you. All right, with that, let's go ahead and jump into today's trade activity. And as you can see, I've got chart 4B pulled up here in front of us, which will give us a nice uh, overview of the four major U.S. equity indices. And uh, let's go ahead and get started here with the Dow Jones Industrial Average, because all of a sudden, this uh, particular chart is looking a lot different uh, than the others. Notice that today was a key day for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It was down 0.76% here today. So it was the worst performer of these four. And uh, remember, that all by itself is somewhat uh, unique. A lot of times when we have a bit of a sell-off day, um, it's going to be led lower by more speculative names. But in today's case, the uh, supposedly safer stocks were the ones that got blasted a little bit more. I noticed in particular the industrial sector uh, really struggled here today with stocks like uh, 3M uh, just you know not really uh, getting their mojo back at the same time when we've got the, the technology stocks working a little bit better. So anyway, be a little bit more cautious around the Dow Jones Industrial Average types of securities if you are uh, trading them uh, with relative strength in mind. Obviously, if you've got a different mode of investing, uh, for instance, long-term dividend growth investing, then a pullback, of course, is something that we've been waiting for for quite some time. So uh, look for those opportunities uh, when they arrive as well to take advantage to the upside. But right now, from a trading perspective, not looking so healthy there for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Today, we cross below that moving average. Now notice the moving average also changed from green to red because today was such an aggressive day. It's actually somewhat similar to what we saw back here. Remember, going from green to red on the moving average is somewhat rare. Usually you have kind of that buffer yellow in between. Uh, but if it's an aggressive enough day, it might be just enough to actually change the uh, direction of the moving average itself. Because remember, when you get a red moving average, what that signifies is price is now below a falling moving average. Much more often is the case, like over here, when the Dow Jones went below the moving average for the first few days, that moving average went yellow because the moving average itself was still going up even though the candles were going down. So it takes a pretty aggressive day to, um, to, to change the shape from negative to positive or vice versa, from, from you know, uh, positive to negative or negative to positive. Uh, it, it, usually it's, it, you, you find that, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, that yellow buffer uh, in between, and we're not seeing that at this case. So um, not only do we have a, uh, a weekly bearish posture, uh, and David would have mentioned that over the weekend on the Dow Jones Industrial Average because that actually occurred on last week's final uh, trading day, but today we can add to that, <coughs> excuse me, add to that bearishness uh, with, the, with the, the red moving average there. Now in addition to that, I would point out 
that uh, the Russell 2000 uh, also sold off here today. It was down 0.72%. So not quite as much as the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but right there neck and neck for you know combining for the worst performer. Now that particular situation does not break my heart. As you guys know, we did place a bear call spread on uh, the Russell 2000 here last week as kind of a balancing type of a trade. So uh, if it were to head lower, uh, I have no issues with that uh, at all. Uh, at this moment in time, the pullback was not aggressive enough to change the posture. You still have a bullish posture. As you can see, the background color of the chart is still green, and the moving average, of course, is still green as well. So uh, where this balances out is anybody's guess, but uh, we did have a close below the low of the high day here today. Notice that this right here would have been the most recent high day. And on um, Friday, I guess the last trading day that we had here, uh, we didn't close below that low. Today we did. And so there's a little bit of a rounding uh, top that's uh, taking place there on the Russell 2000 that you'll want to be aware of. This could very well end up being an interesting choice for an iron condor uh, or uh, other credit selling types of opportunities. It doesn't look all that directional to me at this moment in time. Now, having said that, uh, it does have what's known as a bullish intermediate confirmation signal as of today. Remember what is required for that particular signal is for the green line to be considered bullish. So uh, anytime it's in the upper reversal zone, whether it's falling or rising, uh, it doesn't matter. If as long as above 80, we consider that to be uh, a bullish posture. And then at the same time, combine that with a red line in the lower reversal zone. And that's the momentum label that you see here, and it's at 0 0.09 and falling. There are different ways that we can try to sift through the various signals to try to determine which ones are better and which ones are worse. This one um, is not considered an ideal setup. And the reason for that is the red line is a little bit too uh, oversold here. And it might be giving us uh, a sensation that there, there could be a change. Uh, the winds uh, are, are shifting to a degree within the chart. Now, obviously, that's not a guarantee, but it's just giving us a heads up that this was a pretty aggressive sell off here. In fact, we closed basically at the dead lows of the day here on the Russell 2000. You can see that filled in candle there and uh, no lower uh, shadow or wick on that candle up there. So it's just giving you the impression that had the stock market stayed open for a bit longer, the small caps probably would have have sold off even more, which does not bode well for the open tomorrow morning. Now, obviously, there's a lot of news that can affect that uh, all across the globe. And of course, earnings reports and, and, and the like right here in the United States, including, of course, all of us watching uh, the Delta variant uh, of the coronavirus seeming to get worse by the day. So uh, anyway, anything can change because of news. But as of right now, just the organic feel of the technical analysis is that there could have been uh, further downside had the the bell not rung at the end of the day. And so um, just be on the lookout for that possibility of a little bit more of a give back there. We actually like where the blue line is positioned. Remember, a lot of times we want to see the blue line between 50 and 20 on these bullish intermediate confirmation signals, and that is where we're at right now. So this has been a pretty decent two-day pullback here. Remember, the bullish intermediate confirmation signal is meant to be a buy the dip signal. Now, I generally prefer that signal on an uptrending chart and I'm not sure I would make the claim here on uh, the Russell 2000. This kind of strikes me as more of a sideways chart here. But nonetheless, the signal is there. Uh, the blue line is in a nice position. However, the red line might be just a little bit too oversold, and uh, you might um, you know, be a little bit more cautious as a result uh, of that. Um, and in, in terms of the other two uh, indices that we have on the, on the charts here in front of us, on the left-hand side, uh, the S&P 500 was down point. 3-4% today, but similar to the Russell 2000, we still have the green background color telling us that we continue to have a strongly bullish posture. And of course, this chart looks spectacular, right? That's, a, that's the epitome of, the, uh, uh, of a trend trade right there, right? Higher highs and higher lows. So yes, we've sold off for a couple of days in a row, but they haven't been aggressive and we've maintained our presence above that rising 30-day uh, moving average. We nearly closed with a, uh, a bullish intermediate confirmation signal here as well. And this one would have been a pretty nice one because you can see here the, the intermediate line just barely closed above the 20th percentile. If that had closed at 19.99 instead, uh, that would be 
uh, a bullish intermediate confirmation signal. But it just managed to, to avoid that fate by um, perhaps closing a little bit off the low. Again, remember the Russell 2000 closed at the dead low. Uh, the S&P 500 and these other indices did not close at the dead low. So I think that kind of saved that red line from going into that lower reversal zone there. But had it, then this would have been in kind of an interesting setup because the blue line would have still been between the 50th and the 20th percentile. And this is the chart that is a little bit more appealing uh, as an uptrending chart than what we see here down below with the Russell 2000. And then last but not least, boy, what a day for uh, the NASDAQ. Uh, NASDAQ hits another all-time high. Now, you're not going to be blown away by how much we were up by the end of the day, right? We were only up 0.07%. But the fact that it did this on such a controversial day where the blue chips were getting smoked and we had Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies falling out of favor and even the small caps really taking a leg lower, then um, to add all that up and then just to say, oh yeah, by the way, uh, the NASDAQ composite just coasted to yet another all-time high and closed in the green. Uh, and you can thank Apple for that. Apple did come out and mention that they're going to have their uh, product event uh, a week from today. And so uh, I imagine there'll be a new iPhone phone 13 in a lot of people's hands by the end of the year. And so you can see the new high tag lit up here today. And, uh, and uh, you also saw that the range was fairly tight, uh, blue colored daily range tag there. In fact, that was the case for three out of the four indices here today. The only exception there was the Dow Jones. Uh, it had the, the orange tag there telling us that today's range was more aggressive than the typical average true range. So again, a little bit of an abnormal type of a day there for the blue chips, which traditionally don't move a whole lot. But today, uh, they had a pretty aggressive sell off for all intents and purposes, at least compared to the other indices and really compared to what we've been witnessing for the last seven months as the market has just been grinding higher. Uh, naturally, a 0.76% uh, sell-off is not something that uh, we get too worked up about, but given the circumstances, it is an above average type of a day uh, compared to what we've been seeing here uh, more recently. But um, without a doubt, the, the NASDAQ continues to be our leader here. Uh, it continues to have a strongly bullish posture trading above its rising 30-day moving average. Um, you can see that it's up 34% over the past year, not including any dividends that might have been paid out. Um, and its intermediate line is at 96 right now, which of course is uh, besting the S&P 500s at 92 and the Russell 2000s at 91. So right now it appears that the NASDAQ composite is our leader and the Dow Jones Industrial Average is our leader. Laggart. Let's go ahead and take a look at our three green arrows set up now. And that will be chart 4D for those of you that are playing along at home, uh, assuming you are a premium member of Market Scholars with your own charting package there. And so as we're looking at the three green arrows set up here, um, a little bit of a, a goofy setup here as well, or one that we're not um, used to seeing. And that is we have three of the charts with three green arrows and one chart with three red arrows. Remember, there's oftentimes a transition that takes place from this perspective as well. And um, kind of like the, the, the conversation I was having a moment ago about how the moving average colors have kind of that buffer of yellow. Well, um, on the three green arrows setup, oftentimes you have the background color be white. Uh, after you've had a prolonged period of three green arrows or three red arrows before you transition to that next uh, set uh, of green arrows or red arrows. And so um, right now we have three out of our four charts still looking pretty promising. And then you have one that's the exact opposite. And again, that's the Dow Jones Industrial Average here where you have red arrow number one, red arrow number two in the MACD down below, and red arrow number three coming in today on the stochastic there. So um, again, uh, just to confirm, Dow Jones Industrial Average is our laggard. If you're looking for more bearish trade setups, that might be the place where you'll, you'll be able to find them. Whereas if you're looking for more bullish trade setups, the NASDAQ composite seems to be the place where your hunting ground should be at this moment in time. Let's go ahead and pop on over here to the internet briefly. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support the market Outlook uh, video. And the last time I did the video, uh, which was on Tuesday, uh, since on Thursday I was 
uh, out of the office uh, celebrating my 10 year anniversary. You can see I posted a picture of my wife and I up here for those of you uh, that might not be on uh, Twitter. So uh, happy about that occurrence from a personal perspective, but I did take the day of Thursday off. And so I uh, didn't have the video on Thursday, but the prior Tuesday, you guys were awfully kind to me. 103 of you uh, did click like for me there. So thank you to all of you uh, that helped support the project. Prickly Trader and Fun Jonesy and uh, Warren Young and Kishore and Ken and Marty, uh, Member and Jim and Carl Jayesh. Uh, we got Dale and Margie and George and Kirk and Ron and Edward and the list goes on and on and on. Lots of great folks there helping support us. So thank you so much. Uh, I know I speak for David as well when I say that we, we, we can't uh, do it without you. And so uh, keep it up on your end. We'll do our best to continue these videos for free uh, on our end as well. Also, while we're over here, uh, I did post the sector selector. Now remember, this gets posted on Friday evenings. And so um, this is maybe one day old in this case since yesterday the markets were not trading for Labor Day. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it is a little bit stale here. Now one thing that I would also point out is that the, um, the, the information I use here to kind of populate the statistics for the sector selector is on an equal weighted approach. So if you're more used to the uh, market cap weighted approach, some of your rankings may differ a bit from mine. So it just kind of depends on what approach that you prefer. Uh, I do create this particular graphic uh, or tool, however you want to say it, uh, for my Monday top-down trend trading class. And there, uh, we don't have a prerogative to select bigger companies over smaller companies. Each one of the thousand companies in the Market Scholars 1000, uh, we would be willing to consider. And so uh, we use an equal weighted approach to kind of um, chart out uh, what's happening from a, a sector rotation perspective. Well, uh, you can see up here that the healthcare sector uh, stayed at the top for the third straight week. We did see real estate and utilities both move higher uh, and financials move lower. Now, having said that, today we had a pretty big move up in interest rates and oftentimes that will cause the opposite of those things to occur. So I think right now we're in a bit of a transition from an interest rate perspective. And if you expect interest rates to go higher in the future, then you might want to take a flyer on some of those financials companies out there that tend to benefit a little bit more than uh, REITs and utilities if interest rates were to go up. Now, of course, uh, on the flip side, if you expect interest rates to go down, uh, then that's where real estate and uh, utilities might be a little bit better bet there for you. Um, also, information technology does stay in the top four there. So uh, even from a market cap weighted perspective, let alone what happened today with you know stocks like Apple creating such a move higher in the market cap weighted perspective, um, either way you slice it, information technology remains one of our leaders here at this moment in time. Whereas you see the consumer staples and energy down there towards the bottom, those are more of your Dow Jones Industrial Average types of companies, right? Your Procter & Gamble's of the world would be a Dow Jones component within the consumer staples, and then of course Chevron and Exxon. Actually not uh, Exxon anymore, right? Uh, they, they kicked Exxon out, but Chevron is still part of the Dow Jones Industrial Average within the energy space. Um, one thing I would point out is that communication services is a bit of a, a unique animal. Um, and, and and it's in particular uh, with the regard to uh, the, the market cap versus equal weighted conversation I mentioned a moment ago. From a market cap weighted perspective, communication services actually looks pretty strong. Uh, and the reason for that is stocks like Google and Facebook oftentimes trade in tandem with stocks like Apple. And Google and Facebook are uh, communication services companies that absolutely dominate the communication sector from a market cap weighted perspective. But if you filtered all that out and just said Google and Facebook are equally as important as all the small telecom players or the cable TV companies or what have you, um, then you're, you're finding that communications in general is not a great place to be. So if you're going to be kind of uh, going into communications and you're looking for relative strength, then you're probably going to want to stick with uh, the mega cap um, kind of more technology oriented companies like your Facebooks and your Googles that are out there. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't seem to be a place that is uh, capturing a lot of attention uh, with a, a lot of the other communications uh, components that are a bit smaller out there. All right, let's go ahead and get back on track with some of our charts and let's do some 12 grid analysis. Coming on over here to chart 5A to start that conversation off. 
All right, so uh, a reminder that these 12 grid charts will feature miniature charts that have an either a green or pink background color. If the background colors are green, it means that the intermediate posture using the market forecast technical indicator is considered bullish. And if the background colors are pink, then it means that the intermediate posture using the market forecast is considered bearish. And so anyway, as we're looking at uh, this right now, you can see uh, a healthy mix as is oftentimes the case. Remember this first set of 12 grids uh, has everything from from stocks to cryptocurrencies to you know fixed income to interest rates to you know foreign securities and, and everything in between so uh, you rarely find a clean sweep of, of green or pink on this first set of 12 grids here so let's kind of go through and see what we can uh, learn from this evaluation first of all let's start off with the conversation of interest rates in the lower right hand corner this is what I had mentioned earlier that there was a really nice bounce today in interest rates and you can see that that bounce put us basically at a bit of a resistance area from uh, August 26th and then again on August 12th. But the good news is it's bounced up and off of that rising 30-day uh, moving average. I mentioned that last week when I was with you as well that we are starting to see a bit of a temperature change here in regards to interest rates. And so don't sleep on the financial sector. Uh, you might be able to find some outperformance in some of those banks and other areas there that benefit from uh, widening net interest margin. Uh, anyway, as you can see here, uh, the opposite of when interest rates rise, and by the way, 10-year uh, treasury yield ended today at 1.37. Um, notice the opposite occurs with long-term U.S. Treasuries up here in the middle rung off to the left hand side. Naturally, when interest rates go up, bond prices go lower, all else being equal. And that is exactly what we're seeing right here. So um, if you're trying to, to play uh, these, uh, these movements here, it appears to me that um, going bearish on TLT uh, or going bullish on TNX might be an interesting way to, to gain some alpha out of the market at this exact moment in time. And as I mentioned to you either last week or the week before, one way to play that is TBT. Remember, TBT is a leveraged instrument, so you do have to be careful with that. But what it's designed to do is to kind of short TLT. So it's kind of the opposite of that. So if you're, if you're ever bearish on TLT and you don't feel comfortable shorting it or you don't feel comfortable with bearish trade setups like uh, bear call spreads or you know, long put spreads or what have you, then uh, kind of an easy button approach to that, uh, to kind of play that theme would be TBT. TBT is designed to basically be inverse to TLT. And so TBT was up today off of those movements there and now has its own uh, you know, green moving average there or price is now above a rising moving average for the first time in three months here on TBT. Uh, other things of interest is the US dollar. US dollar has had a pretty ugly two week period here and that's a little bit of a surprise considering it was just back here on August 19th, this thing looked like it was breaking out. Well, that's why we got to babysit these positions and check in uh, on a daily basis like we do in this video because things can change even when your expectations are set in a certain direction. And that's what has happened here with the US dollar. After looking like it wanted to break out to the upside, the exact opposite happened. This thing actually broke out to the downside. Uh, not, maybe that's a little bit aggressive to say broke out to the downside. It kind of came down to this low area where it was being establishing a little bit of support back here in the first week of August. And so you kind of have a little bit of a double bottom formation right there. We did have a nice bounce up today, by the way, on the US dollar. Perhaps some of the controversy around Bitcoin helped uh, with, with that situation there. But nonetheless, did have a bounce up but we are still trading below a falling 30-day moving average on the US dollar, and we still have a strongly bearish intermediate posture on the US dollar. Let's talk about Bitcoin a little bit. You can see over here, Bitcoin had a really aggressive day. Uh, it absolutely was all over the place. First of all, you had the news today that El Salvador officially uh, welcomed it in as a, uh, a legitimate currency in its country. In fact, some of you saw me tweeting about uh, McDonald's in El Salvador now being able to um, accept uh, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, I, I jokingly referred to it as 
uh, croc chain. Uh, those of you that are uh, dividend growth investing nerds like myself might remember the name Ray Kroc being associated uh, with McDonald's. But that kind of seemed to fall on uh, a, a, a little bit in terms of uh, whether my joke landed. It, it mostly did not. Uh, so uh, let's just say that uh, it, the, the blockchain di does uh, have a place in El Salvador all of a sudden. And that makes it unique. Remember, this is a bit of an experiment still. We don't really know if Bitcoin's going to work. There's a lot of people that believe in it through and through. Got to admire their faith that they place in it. Uh, and it very well could work out. We do know that it's had tremendous success over the last decade and very well might uh, continue that success going forward. But I think we can all agree that it's a bit of an experiment at this point. And El Salvador uh, could very well uh, give us some clues as to whether it can be used a bit as a currency or not. And so there was some enthusiasm going around Bitcoin today as we started the day. But then uh, we saw the rug pulled out, even saw um, Coinbase uh, coming out and saying some of their um, logins weren't working and things like that. So um, it was a wild day for the cryptocurrency space, including Bitcoin. And you can see we had a massive and bearish engulfing day here on Bitcoin that really engulfed the last, let's call it two or three weeks worth of price information there. We did end at around 46,000 on Bitcoin. Um, I still think it's more interesting to the upside to the downside personally from these levels because we're still above that rising moving average. So for those of you that are bold uh, and brave and you don't mind the volatility, then coming down and having that uh, Bitcoin kiss that upward trending 30 day moving average might have been an interesting place uh, to take a, a, a position, a speculative one at that. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, just prepare yourself for volatility in the cryptocurrency space. Notice that we still have a strongly bullish posture on Bitcoin despite an aggressive 7% pullback in Bitcoin here today. I also wanted to bring up foreign stocks from the developed perspective. Notice that all of a sudden EFA is at three month highs. Now this has kind of been a long journey. We kind of topped out back here on June 8th and we had this kind of you know, uh, pullback that made folks forget about EFA, right? The whole conversation recently has really been about China and the emerging markets. And China, by the way, had a big day today uh, of course, China was open for two days this week while we've only been open for one. But um, a lot of those Chinese stocks did move higher today and that helped support EEM, which now has its own green moving average there, price above a rising moving average at this point. So there's been a lot of talk about EEM. And meanwhile, we've kind of really uh, haven't been paying a lot of attention to EFA, but all of a sudden EFA is at new uh, three month highs here. Uh, not even the S&P 500 can make that claim at this exact moment in time. So uh, nice day there for the foreign stocks out there, uh, whether it was developed up 0.07% to new three month highs or even EEM, which was up 0.58% here today, outpacing uh, the, the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Let's take a look at some sector analysis now, chart f uh, 5C for that. And here we got a little bit of, uh, we've got some pink going down the middle vertical row here on the second uh, kind of row, as you can see. Uh, we've got financials, industrials, staples, all with a pink background. And then we also have energy uh, with a pink background. Of those four charts, energy is the one that's struggling the most. Um, the other ones, um, you know, are starting to become a little bit more concerning. I'm not as concerned about financials. Now, part of the reason is because interest rates have started to move up. Notice that the financials were down today. They were down 0.6%, but that did outpace the utilities, which were down 1.32%, and real estate, which was down 1.11%. So interest rates were up today, which you expect to have financials relatively stronger than the utilities and the REITs, and that's exactly what we found today. Now note that doesn't mean absolutely stronger, it just means relatively stronger. When the stock market itself is down, you can have a situation where the financials did outperform the REITs and the utilities, but they themselves still did finish down a bit. Nonetheless, we are at a rising moving average right now, so I'm, I'm still somewhat interested in the financials at this very moment in time. The industrials and the staples becoming maybe a little bit more concerning. Those are some pretty big sell-off days there for both of those. Industrials crashed right through their 30-day moving average today like a hot knife through butter. And you can see we closed near the lows of the session there today as well. That was a pretty ugly 1.73% sell-off there in the industrials today. And that was the worst performer out of all of these sectors. 
the staples were down over 1% themselves, 1.15%. Remember, that's uh, that's equally as hard to do. Uh, while industrials were down more, uh, it's a lot easier for industrials to swing around because they're highly cyclical. For the staples to move over 1%, that's a pretty aggressive day for them. And so similar to the financials, you're sitting right on that upward trending 30-day moving average right now. So maybe there's a little bit of a Hail Mary opportunity there. But what I'm not necessarily as ex excited about is um, the staples kind of topped out before breaking to new highs. So you kind of have this double top right here on the staples. Whereas with the financials, you did just barely cross up and through that prior high there. So you kind of still have that trend of higher highs and higher lows just barely hanging on uh, there with the financials. Whereas you can't really make that claim here with the staples. So we want to kind of keep those on a little bit of a tighter leash right there. In terms of the areas that outperformed here today, it was technology, you know, with Apple leading the way higher. So tech was up today. Communications was up today with stocks like Facebook up uh, here today. And then we also saw um, the discretionary stocks up today as well. So those were the only three that finished in the green here today. All right, let's go ahead and get into our trade application example. And this, uh, the stock is going to be uh, a component from the technology sector. And as you can see here, technology just keeps on motoring higher. Now, specifically, it's going to be in the payment space of technology. It's technically considered an IT services industry group component. And uh, for this conversation, maybe I should take you back on, on Twitter. As I mentioned before, some of you that follow me on Twitter will know that you'll probably get a lot of my trade ideas if you're following me on Twitter because when things catch my eye, I try to uh, get that information out there to let my audience know uh, what it is that I'm looking at or what's capturing my attention. And so if we start scrolling lower on my, uh, my timeline, um, we would go back to Friday let me see if I can find Friday. Where is it? There it is. So September 3rd, you can see that um, I mentioned that STNE was one of three stocks to hit 52-week lows in the Market Scholars 1000 this week. And then some of the interesting things about that particular company, which I've never really spent a lot of time on myself in the past, but it's kind of been there and um, you know uh, been of interest to me, I guess that you could say, simply because a couple of people that I admire, uh, Warren Buffett and Kathy Wood, both own this Brazilian digital payment stock. In fact, I think that might be the only stock that combines those two. As most of you are aware, uh, Warren Buffett is a little bit more on the value side. Kathy Wood is a little bit more on the growth side. So it's rare to have overlapping stock picks between the two of them. Uh, Stone uh, is an example of that, Stone Co., which is a Brazilian uh, digital payments company. It's also down 50% from its highs, which makes it uh, an interesting candidate as being a rare stock that's not necessarily considered overbought uh, with uh, the stock market at all-time highs here. It also had oversold cluster signals on the weekly candle charts, and it's at a, a potential level of horizontal support. And this chart right here can kind of point that out a little bit more that I posted to Twitter there on Friday. Uh, and what I'm referencing in terms of the um, interesting level of support is that technical analysis theory that old highs can become new support after the breakout takes place. And so with these two kind of blue arrows here, you can see that this stock topped out at around $45 one time back here in um, early 2019 and then another time here in early 2020. Eventually broke through that area, and went all the way up to $95 per share. So it more than doubled from that breakout price, but has given all of that back. So you had this breakout, you're now retesting those levels for basically the first time in a couple of years or at least a year and a half. And not only that, but you're getting these oversold cluster signals to appear right along with it. That little green dot right there and that little green dot right there signify those oversold cluster signals using the market forecast technical indicator when you're looking at a weekly candle chart. Now to fast forward in real time, because this was posted on Friday, just to confirm, we still have those signals. If I were to pull up uh, let's just pull up uh, chart 4A. This will be our market forecast one grid. And if I pull up uh, STNE, which is Stone Co., um, you can see, first of all, we have 
cluster signals on the daily candle chart. So this is a three month daily we're looking at here. So for the last two days, today and Friday, we've had oversold cluster signals. Now notice the last time we had these oversold cluster signals, it did lead to a four day rally. And then over here you had these oversold cluster signals that led to a two day rally there. So we might be brewing up for a potential reversion to the mean move here um, in the daily context. But just as interesting to me is what's happening from a weekly uh, chart perspective. So if I pull up a five-year weekly candle chart now, this is what that looks like. And you can see here that three out of the last four weeks, we've had these little green dots showing up, telling us that the green line, the blue line, and the red line are all in the lower reversal zone on the same days for three out of the last four weeks. Now, of course, you can't really count this week so much because today is really the only day so far of trading this week. So it's no guarantee it'll end the week with this. But um, the other two are confirmed, right? As of Friday, you could say that last week officially was an oversold cluster. And you can kind of see what, it, what this looks like with a candle perspective as opposed to uh, the bar chart that I showed you before. Here are those two moments in time that I mentioned before. So that would have been April 2019. It topped out right around $45. It did so again kind of here in the February 2020 time period, right before the coronavirus dropout. And then the breakout to the upside leading up to $95, selling off by 50%. We're back down to 45 bucks right now, where I'm just kind of interested in this one um, to kind of speculate with it. So what I opted to do, and remember the trade is already done, I sent it out to all of you that are premium members via Telegram earlier today, but what I opted to do was to buy a leaps call option out in January of 2023. So there are, four, there are 500 days until expiration on this. And I paid, I think it was $12.60 for that particular contract. For those of you that are not familiar with that technique, basically what I'm doing is I'm trying to to get some leveraged bullishness to the upside. Now naturally you could just buy this stock if you wanted to, but the, um, the upshot of buying the call options instead is that you spend a lot less money and therefore if you're just completely flat out wrong with your expectations, you won't be hurt as much in many of the cases. Um, by spending $12.60, that equates to basically $1,200 that I spent out of my pocket today to buy that contract. Um, and that was the $40 call, by the way. And so my break even would be around 52 bucks. So it'd be around right there. In other words, if it were to get back to just where it was trading two weeks ago, um, in the next 500 days, uh, I would have a very interesting um, leveraged bet to the upside. On the other hand, if this stock just keeps on torpedoing for whatever reason, remember they operate in Brazil, so we're, we're not quite as well aware of the company here in the United States. So who knows, maybe the stock does just completely crater from here. Well, if that's the case, my worst case scenario is the $1,200 I spent on the call option. Remember, a call option controls 100 shares of stock. So alternatively, I could have just bought 100 shares of stock today, but I would have had to spend about $4,500 if I were to do that. So instead, I spent $1,200 buying a call option. And if we do have a big move to the upside in the coming 500 days, then I've got a horse in the race. So bit a bit of a speculative trade here, but one with some unique characteristics from a technical perspective that I just want to see kind of how it plays out. If it breaks down, you know, in coming months, I'm not afraid to get out of it with it, like say a 50% stop loss or something along those lines. But I do want to kind of see how it works out and see if we can get a little bit of a bounce from uh, these oversold weekly candles that we've seen here recently. Okay, so that's what I had for you here today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, if you did, I ask one simple thing out of you. Click like for us there on Twitter. I'll have it pinned up to the top of my timeline. You can also uh, just click the heart button there uh, while you're watching it in the Twitter widget on our website. You can also find the tweet in question on YouTube if you watch the videos over there in the description area. If you click the link next to the, the Twitter area, uh, it will take you to that tweet. So uh, be nice and easy. You can also find the, the tweet in the email that we send those of you that are on our email distribution list. So uh, four different easy ways for you guys to help support this project. Uh, assuming we get 100 likes uh, on the video, I'll plan on uh, being back in the saddle uh, with you guys there on Thursday. Uh, as far as I know, David should be back with you tomorrow as well. So I hope you guys had a wonderful Labor Day weekend as we kick things off here into the fall. A uh, little bit of a down day for most of the indices today. Watch out on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. That one's starting to look a little bit more dicey, uh, but a uh, little bit of a leadership role coming out of Apple in the 
the NASDAQ composite here today. So with that, I want to wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.